I was going to, uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, there's a long story as to why I submitted a particular uh, abstract, which I'm not presenting now. And I was going to explain it, and it was going to make perfect sense, but man, we're so short on time, aren't we? So I'm just going to have to plunge right on ahead, and you're going to have to take my word. I had all these jokes ready and everything like that, but unfortunately, no. Uh, I'm going to be speaking instead. I, I even had remarks prepared, and if you want, I will leave time at the end of my talk. So you can ask me a bit about the liberalism as a theology thing, because uh, just full disclosure now, I may have to leave early today. Sorry. So I will actually, I've trimmed my thing down to about 30 minutes, according to the According to the website that I used, it's just 30 minutes long, so there should be time for questions at the end. Um, yes, I did have a piece published in uh, Fidelitas, which was titled, Making Room for Siblings of the Spirit, a response to the responsum on blessings of same-sex unions. Now, if you have not read that paper, or you haven't seen that edition yet, I was very honored and humbled that there was a response to me published by Father Philip Bochansky, the executive director of Courage International which, if you don't know, is an apostolate dedicated to supporting Catholics who struggle with same-sex attraction. Uh, and he deigned to respond to, uh, to my little piece. Uh, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it. I, in fact, I brought my copy, which is all marked up and has lots of marginalia by me uh, re reacting to what he said. And I also spoke a bit with my headmaster about this, who passed on some concerns that Dr. Flamin had uh, about the general idea. So I have uh, incorporated them into this. So if you haven't read my article... Uh, well, get a hold of it so you can read Father Phillips' response to it, and you can decide with whom you agree more. But I, ha I am attempting to respond to some of the things that he said in his uh, very gracious reply to me. <clears throat> so let's see how accurate that was, that uh, website that said I can do this in half an hour. On March 15th of 2021, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the CDF, issued a responsum ad dubium intended to settle definitively whether the Church has, quote, the power to give the blessing of unions to persons of the same sex, end quote. According to the CDF, she does not. But what was especially interesting about this responsum was that it came only a few days after the notorious provocateur and commentator Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, who had previously married another man in 2017, publicly announced that out of devotion to his Catholic faith, he had consecrated himself to St. Joseph, and was now living a celibate life. Uh, Yiannopoulos' former husband, whom he now calls the guy I live with, had been, quote, demoted to housemate, end quote. Their situation, as he describes it, is now that of two men who live together and are emotionally committed to one another without being sexually intimate. Now, the convergence, the temporal convergence of these two public proclamations highlights, and I need to be clear here, not a mistake, not an error, not even a problem, really, but a lacuna in the responsum. The text and the argument it makes clearly states that same-sex sexual unions cannot be blessed. It goes on to affirm that the church can bless, quote, individual persons with homosexual inclinations who manifest the will to live in fidelity to the revealed plans of God as proposed by church teaching, end quote. But it never answers or even acknowledges the problem of whether Christ has given the church the power to bless chaste, or continent, if you prefer, same-sex companionships. That is, committed emotional partnerships between persons of the same sex, which, in fidelity to the revealed plans of God, do not include sexual intercourse or any other form of deliberate sexual arousal. Now, while the Christian faith requires self-denial and mortification, we are also warned not to put unnecessary stumbling blocks in the way of our brothers and sisters, and we should be faithfully open to the possibility that there may be forms of spiritual care the Church could be offering this community, to use some of the uh, language that Dr. Fast was referring to before, that too many of them are not receiving. Now, let me say this because... I don't think I made it clear enough in the text. Okay. What I'm talking about is there's one possible option that has been proposed for Catholics who have same-sex attractions, and it's a, a committed relationship without sexual intercourse, and it's not that terribly uncommon. There, there are much more examples, far more examples out there than people seem to realize, but the responsum doesn't mention this or comment on whether it's appropriate or not. 
Now, Father Philip argues in his response to me that the church should not bless these kinds of arrangements either. And I just want to make this clear. Maybe he's right. Right? But my problem is, if he's right, the magisterium needs to say that. And it didn't, at any point, address that in its responsum, or to my knowledge in any document that it's issued. Uh, and that's a shortcoming. And it owes it to these Catholics to give that. Because either, either they're living in sin, and they need to know that, or this is appropriate, and it's an option that they can consider, and they need to be told that explicitly. So either way, there needs to be an official magisterial proclamation on this, I believe. And I would draw an analogy between the responsum and humani vitae. Right. So humani vitae, there was this expectation that Paul VI and the spirit of the council was going to relax the church's teaching on contraception. Uh, this did not happen. It was disappointing to many people, just like Pope Francis reaffirming the church's teaching on sexuality disappointed many people today, although it shouldn't have surprised any of them. Uh, but John Paul II, whose feast we celebrate today, recognized that, again, nothing wrong with Humanae Vitae, but it needed to be supplemented. Right? If not contraception, then what? And this is where you get Donum Vitae, you get the talks on the theology of the body, etc. I propose something similar has to happen with this responsum. Like Humanae Vitae, it helpfully reaffirms the church's sexual teaching revealed by Christ, but it needs to be supplemented. Okay, if not this, then what? I think it needs a positive moral aspirational vi uh, vision to complement its negation. And I argue, or at least I suggest, I'm open to being told I'm mistaken, that this can be found in a restored and partially monasticized sibling-making ritual, Adolfo Poesis. Uh, in other words, I think we can look to the church's own history and its own precedents to find a solution to this problem. Uh, and it, I'm going to try to propose ways of articulating this issue, which the magisterium, I think, could fruitfully adopt in future pronouncements, which could be pastorally sensitive to the concerns of uh, gay Catholics, or whatever we want to call them, while remaining unambiguously orthodox. So first of all, let's establish exactly what the responsum said, because as usual, the media didn't really do that. Right. The specific wording of the dubium that the CDF responded to was, this was the question, does the church have the power to give the blessing to unions of persons of the same sex? Now, the question does not define what these unions actually are, and neither does the response, although it takes time to define a sacramental and a blessing. So we can only make inferences about what unions are in this context. You know, um, etymologically it means, you know, unis formed into one, but what, what's the nature of that union here? Neither the question nor the response really says. So, which unions is, are the church empowered by Christ to bless? Well, the responsum does answer this. The church can only bless relationships that are, quote, objectively and positively ordered to receive and express grace, according to the designs of God inscribed in creation and fully revealed by Christ the Lord, end quote. Right. Therefore, the response states that what it calls same-sex unions cannot be blessed. And in its explanation of why this is the case, the CDF observes that sexual activity is only legitimate within a certain kind of union marriage, which is, quote, the indissoluble union between a man and a woman open in itself to the transmission of life. Therefore, continuing the quote, it is not licit to impart a blessing on relationships or partnerships, even stable, that involve sexual activity outside of marriage, as is the case of unions between persons of the same sex, end quote. Now, note uh, the responsum does say that these, these relationships may contain, quote, positive elements which are in themselves to be valued and appreciated, end quote. But they are still, quote, not ordered to the creator's plan, end quote. So this is really important. The reasoning here is that same-sex unions cannot be blessed because the church cannot bless non-marital sexual activity, which sexual activity between two persons of the same sex will always be. So what we gather from this is that the responsum takes for granted that the unions it is talking about 
involve sexual activity. If that is so, then its pronouncement that the church is unable to bless same-sex unions is utterly unsurprising and obviously correct. But this leaves open the question of whether the church could bless an arrangement where two Catholics of the same sex commit to each other in a chaste or continent relationship. Now, Father Bochansky will argue it can be continent without being chaste. So you, and we may have time to get into that or not. But where they're not having sex is what I'm trying to say, or anything approximating sex. An example of this would be the American poet Dunstan Thompson and his lover Philip Trower, who converted to Catholicism and asked their priest whether they could live together continently, chastely. And the priest chose to grant them this permission, and they spent the rest of their lives together uh, in loving and continent devotion to God and to one another. So we, we can ask, was Thompson's spiritual director wrong to sanction this arrangement? And the fact is the response does not tell us. Right? And again, this is from the 50s that this happened, at least. 1952, if I remember right. So this isn't like a new, well, it's not at all a new situation, as I hope we'll get into. But even in like recent memory, it's not new. Um, now, it's not obvious either from Catholic theology or common parlance that the word union in the context of an emotional partnership necessarily has to involve sexual activity uh, or arousal in any way. And we can actually be sure that there are such things as non-carnal unions. I give a bunch of examples in the paper itself, but I'll just pick one here because uh, it comes up again later in this talk. If there's a couple and one of them has been sacramentally married and not received a declaration of nullity, so they are living with their new partner to whom they're civically married and they're raising children, we all know of such situations, right? Uh, if that person you know, wants to receive communion uh, but can't leave their new partner because they have to raise the children or whatever the case is, then they're called to live in complete continence. Right? And yet, uh, paragraph 1650 of the Catholic uh, Catechism refers to this relationship as a new union. So we have, and there's other examples, like Josephite marriages, you could say, I mean, those are obviously examples of unions that don't involve sexual congress. But there's, there's there also the catechism talks about uh, free unions as a contradiction of terms because union means union emotionally, not just sexually. Uh, but anyways, the point is that it's not really obvious why they would have assumed the word union had to refer to a sexual relationship. Now, Given that they did, given that's how the CDF answered this, I think for the sake of avoiding scandal and confusion, let's just stick with that vocabulary. Okay. Same-sex unions, we'll, we'll, we'll use that as shorthand for sexual relationships, obviously sinful, cannot be blessed. But then what do we call something like what Philip Trower had, right, where there was no sexual activity at all? Can we call it a same-sex friendship? Right, we've discussed friendship today. Well, that seems inadequate because most people recognize that you can have a friend, even a really good friend, a friend who brings you close to God, but it's still situational, right? You move apart from each other. You, it's hard to keep up. Friendship wanes. That happens, and there's no moral fault involved with that. That's not what they had, right? What Thompson and Trower gave each other was a promise of cohabitation mutual support, and shared emotional affection under the direction of a priest. That's something that's more duty-imposing. It's more exclusive than, a, than just a friendship. So for the sake of shorthand, I'm going to call those kind of relationships same-sex companionships because they, have, they avoid that sexual connotation of union, but there's a level of association and obligation that I don't think friendship necessarily connotes. All right. Now, Having recognized that the church cannot bless same-sex unions, can she bless same-sex companionships? Now, the responsum does not speak to this, but church history suggests, and I'm, I'm, I'm hedging my bets here a lot because I'm ready to be shown this is incorrect, but church history suggests that the answer may be yes. Right. So historians have noted the historical fact of the Christian ritual blessing known as the Adolfo Poesis. Right. I'm sorry, Gerard, for my bad Greek pronunciation. I know there's, there's alternate Greek pronunciations anyway. So. From the evidence we have, this is the sibling making, or brother making, right? But obviously, it could be between two women as well. 
sibling-making ceremony. From the evidence we have, and I'm talking about the responsibly parsed, studied evidence, not the kind of sensationalistic interpretation of pseudo-historians. From the responsibly parsed evidence we have, it seems to be, for all the world, an example of the church, or at least her representatives, blessing continent and mostly same-sex partnerships, which are characterized by an intense emotional and spiritual friendship. Now, we have lots and lots of liturgical texts and rubrics for this from the Byzantine tradition, um, and there's different versions of it. Some involve uh, each companion places one hand on the gospel while holding a lit candle in the other. The priest prays that just as God found it fitting for the apostles Philip and Bartholomew, or the martyrs Sergius and Bacchus, to be, quote, be united, bound one unto the other, not by nature, but by faith and the spirit, end quote that he would also bless his servants here present, quote, granting the, unto them peace and love and oneness of mind, end quote. The ceremony concludes with the two spiritual siblings who share a, quote, spiritual love, kissing the gospel, the priest, and each other. Now, this is best documented in the East, but there's also lots of uh, evidence of its de facto existence in the West. We've all heard of brothers in arms, right, in chivalry. And there's like, you know, high profile examples of this. For example, uh, King Malcolm of Scot the third of Scotland, who, you know, is the hero at the end of Macbeth. Uh, he seems to have been in one of the, and he, who is married to a saint, by the way. His wife, uh, Queen Margaret, is a canonized saint. Uh, he was known as a brother by covenant or a sworn brother to Tostig Godwinson. Other examples as well, Simon de Montfort, the founder of the English Parliament, seems to have been in one of these arrangements as well. Uh, and again, it's, it's more de facto, but the evidence suggests that it was a ritual which occurred in church. There was an oath of mutual commitment, which would be sworn on the Gospels or on a crucifix. Um, and there were oaths which were written down as contracts, and it was sealed with a kiss of peace. And it, it's important, because it's a kiss of peace. This isn't like, you may now kiss the bride. Right? This is a kiss like we have in the liturgy, in the Mass. Right? And the covenants had the partners bequeathing their estates to each other and promising to split their war spoils up with each other pay each other's ransoms, this sort of thing. Now, again, despite what historians like John Boswell would claim, this was definitively not a gay marriage. And you can tell by reading the thing. Like, for example, one of the Adolfo Cuesa's prayers says, uh, quote, cleanse from their heart every stain and impurity and vouchsafe unto them to love one another without hatred and without scandal all the days of their lives, end quote. Now, it is, to say the very, very least, implausible to imagine that a sexual relationship between two men or two women could be regarded as pure and without scandal, especially in, in Byzantium, where sodomy was a capital offense. Right? So the intention of this sibling-making blessing was clearly that the two involved would henceforth relate to one another as intimately but also as chastely as siblings would. And, it's, and, and that's why it's written right there in the vow. So it's publicly known that that's what this is. Uh, and the fact that the Adolfo Poesa ceremony was widely practiced for centuries in both East and West, effectively, as I'll get to, up to the present day, that is not, in and of itself, proof that the Church has power to bless same-sex companionships. Because it is possible that every instance of this was a priest acting ultra vires and invalidly. Uh, and Father Philip says this in response to my paper. He says, quote, uh, Whatever the nature or status of this sibling-making may have been in the past, it is clear that the Church has not reinstituted such a liturgy, even as it has restored or created other rites, such as the permanent diaconate, consecrated versions, ministry of catechists, etc., the Second Vatican Council, end quote. But this assumes the Church needed to reinstitute it. And you only need to reinstitute something you've deinstituted, which was the case with these other examples, such as the permanent diaconate. Now, the magisterium, to my knowledge, from what I can find, never officially deinstituted Adolfo Poesis or, or condemned it. And in fact, it, it has actually continued to this day, at least in some communions. So, for example, uh, Robert Darling Young wrote in First Things back in the 90s about how back in 1985, she and a traveling companion were at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and a Syrian archbishop uh, performed that rite for them, suggested it to them, actually. Said, you seem like you're really good friends and devout Christians. Can I, would you like to be united as, as sisters? So this has continued up till effectively the present day. 
in, in some communions at least. Now again, it is possible that all of these were examples of mistakes. The point isn't that they were good necessarily, but the point is that they happened, that they still happen for a really long time. Doesn't prove they're good, but we also have to remember the maxim of lex, lex orandi, uh, lex credendi, right? The law of prayer is the law of faith. If there's a really strong liturgical you know, basis for something, often that's a source of our theology, unless there's some really good reason uh, to reject it. You know, in the West, we've decided not to commune infants anymore, despite it having a long pedigree. Uh, maybe this is a case of something like that, too, something that the church did a bunch, but we have you know, reflected on it, and we shouldn't do it anymore. But if that's the case, the magisterium needs to weigh in on this, and they, and they need to take that clear step for the sake of the souls and consciences of people who are, who are aware of it, let's say, and are struggling. Uh, again, I would argue there's good reason to say that this is a good practice, which the church should more heartily embrace based on the very principles elucidated in the responsum. Uh, because again, what they say is that when a blessing is invoked on particular human relationships, it's necessary that what is blessed be objectively and positively ordered to receive and express grace, according to the designs of God and creation and revealed by Christ the Lord. Now, the secular world's understanding of homosexuality is, is hopelessly muddled and confused. So homosexuality is seen as an integral part of a gay person's identity. It's seen as a disposition to find emotional fulfillment in romantic relationships with a person of the same sex. It's also seen as a physical desire for sexual intercourse with persons of the same sex. And these three things are all mingled together into this, uh, this one label of homosexuality. And by, in so doing, they can say that the church is forcing gay people to reject themselves, right? by saying they can't have same-sex intercourse. But these arguments make the mistake of thinking that sexual orientation is equivalent to having physical desires rather than about how one experiences fulfillment through emotional intimacy. Now, that emotional disposition may be often beset with a certain kind of sexual desire, but that doesn't make it identical to that temptation. So I think we need to be careful about what we mean when we talk about homosexuality. So in a theological sense, paragraph 2357 of the Catechism says that homosexuality is relations between men or women who experience an exclusive or predominant sexual attraction towards persons of the same sex. Okay, now sexual is important here as an adjective. Sexual attraction between two members of the same sex obviously cannot express, as the Catechism puts it, a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. That kind of sexual desire is intrinsically not ordered uh, towards God's ideal for creation. But colloquially speaking, homosexuality is understood as something besides sexual attraction. And again, this is just talk I'm talking about how people talk about this now. Right? When people say love is love as a way of expressing you know, with their rainbow flags. They're talking about something emotional at that point, more so than they're talking about something sexual. Uh, now, the, of course, famous anti-theist Christopher Hitchens once put it this way, homosexuality is not just a form of sex, it's a form of love. This was his defense of it. Now, again, you may wonder why I'm giving Hitchens credibility, although Father Bachansky quotes Kurt Vonnegut in his response to me, so I guess, you know, all bets are off in terms of writers you can quote. But bear in mind, Hitchens was also paraphrasing Oscar Wilde, who did have a pretty strong, you know, who was a Catholic in his, in his way, certainly by the end of his life, right? He had fully embraced the church. And uh, famously, of course, Wilde referred to it as the love that dares not speak its name. Right? And he called it a deep spiritual affection. Right? So whatever credibility you want to grant Hitchens or Wilde or, or any of these kind of people, what's important here is that they perceive a distinction between homosexuality as a form of sexual attraction or activity and homosexuality as a form of emotional disposition. Now, if you look at most dictionary definitions of homosexuality, they say it's a sexual or romantic attraction to members of the same sex. And the key word here is romantically. To be romantically attracted to someone is generally understood as meaning that you're emotionally drawn to them, or you're seeking a level of emotional intimacy with them. 
over and above simply desiring to be sexually involved with them. And if it's difficult to imagine romance without carnality, remember the etymology of the word romance. Right? It comes from chivalric tales depicting knights in courtly love, right? an intensely spiritual affection that's almost always physically unconsummated. Right? So the very origins of the word romance practically denote a non-sexual relationship, a platonic relationship, if you want to call it that. Now, romantic and sexual attraction may usually accompany each other, but one can fulfill their attraction towards a person emotionally without having sexual congress with them. Now, again, and this is not to draw an analogy, which, as Pope Francis has said, you can't, but if you think of the Josephite marriages, those have heterosexuals who are romantically drawn to each other and find emotional satisfaction in a union of hearts and souls without any sexual union. And it's also the case with civically divorced and remarried couples, as we've described before. Right? There's an emotional um, interconnection there and commitment there without sexual activity going on. Right? Now, obviously those are different because in principle those people could get married. Right? If, if, you know, in fact, there are examples of like St. Therese's parents initially were in a Josephite marriage but then chose to consummate. Uh, all the better for us, of course. Um, but, so does that mean it's, it's not applicable then to same-sex companionships? Um, is a strong but chaste emotional connection between two persons of the same sex objectively and positively ordered to receive grace? Well, obviously the church's experience has been that intense friendship between persons of the same sex can be a powerful means of grace. Uh, and, in fact, the Catechism says in paragraph 2359, those with same-sex attraction can resolutely approach Christian perfection with the aid of prayer, sacramental grace, and disinterested friendship. Now, Aristotle, who's usually more scientific than this, when he defines the word friend, says uh, it's a single soul dwelling in two bodies. Now, in his eulogy for St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory of Nazianzus used this exact image to depict the unity between them. If you haven't read it, it's, it's really touching. He talks about uh, when, as time went on, we acknowledged our mutual affection. Philosophy was our aim. We were all in all to one another, housemates, uh, table mates, intimates, with one object in life, an affection for each other growing warmer and stronger. Right. Oh, how can I mention these things without tears? We seem to have one soul inhabiting two bodies. Now, throughout this very emotional memorial, Gregory uses images indicating that God had united them through their shared love of God and truth. And that took the tangible form of them living, working, and eating together. And that's why I use the word companionship. It's got that connotation of sharing bread with each other. Now, this is a spiritual friendship, like Aylred described in his book from the 12th century. It's a friendship that holds nothing back from one's companion, calls on Christ to be the third member of their bond. Now, this is sometimes witnessed, this chaste friendship between people of different sexes. For example, think of St. Francis and St. Clair of Assisi. You know, Chesterton said they had a pure and spiritual romance. Other times it occurs between people of the same sex. Now, let me just say this very clearly right now. So here's our, our modern post-Freudian mania for psychoanalysis. It's going to probably drive us to hear things like what, you know, this, this oration by Gregory and, of course, the first question many people are going to ask is, oh, were they gay? Would a straight guy talk that way about another man? Now, this is a, really a tedious discourse. Uh, and it's also it's wrong-headed and it's impossible, partly because sexual orientation is kind of a modern concept anyways, some, something of a questionable concept. Not every culture has taken the time to define sexual orientation or acknowledge it. Uh, China, for example, it didn't have the concept until like the 80s, basically. Um, and and it, it, it's interesting how now we have these phenomena like, look at, look at the language people have. They talk about bromances or man crushes or heterosexual life partners. Right? Now, those are a little bit ironic, obviously, I think. But it's interesting that there's this recognition that there can be a, a heterosexual friendship, a friendship untainted with sexuality, which has the same level of intensity and commitment as a, as a romance. Right? But it's not necessarily you know, gay in nature. 
which goes to show why, in my opinion, trying to determine whether any historical figure was, was gay or homosexual is fruitless. Because when you're, especially when you're talking about saints of the church, we all know that if they had any strong, intense friendships, they would have been sexually chaste. So beyond that, is there any value? There's probably no possibility of it anyway. But is there any value of distinguishing between a deep, effective friendship and a chaste friendship that's, that's gay? Like, was St. Anthem of Canterbury, was he the kind of person who experienced such a deep, effective relationship with men that in letters to them he called them his lovers? You know, or was he a celibate gay man? Right. You know, did, did our patron John Henry Newman, did he love Ambrose St. John, who he's buried next to, or was he in love with him? Well, in either case, if that love was a holy, selfless, non-sexual, spiritual love, then what exactly is the difference whether or not there was also a romantic element to it? Again, I'm not talking about an erotic or sexual element. I'm talking about a romantic element to it. What, at that point, if we know there's not this sinful, uh, a natural union that's going on in sexuality, what is the difference, the useful difference between distinguishing a bromantic friendship and a romantic friendship? Uh, now, Father Philip gives an answer. I don't find it convincing. Um, maybe we can talk about that, but... Uh, if we recognize that these kinds of deep and loving same-sex uh, same -sex friendships can be a means of grace. I'm just talking about same-sex friendships generally. They can obviously be a means of grace, like they were for the Cappadocian fathers. Right. Many issues are cleared up for us if we recognize that. So we can understand why, as the responsum recognizes, many same-sex unions contain, as it calls them, positive elements. Right. Because the responsum seems to be implicitly recognizing that key ingredient of committed friendship is present, even though it's contaminated by unchastity. Now, it seems to me if they are the sort of human relationships that can be blessed by the church, then it, they can bring their participants closer to Christ in so blessing them. So, okay, it seems uncontroversial that same-sex friendships can be blessed by the church. All right. But let's go further. Can and should situations where two members of the same sex make a commitment to live with each other in an exclusive and dedicated way be blessed by the church? And I'd argue there is good reason to think that there is. So the responsum acknowledges there are, quote, individual persons. Can I phrase there? Individual persons with homosexual inclinations who manifest the will to live in fidelity to the revealed plans of God as proposed by church teaching. End quote. But the human person is not called to be an individual person. That's, in fact, that phrase is nearly a contradiction in terms. It is not good for the man to be alone. No. The very reason the church uses personalist language is because it draws attention to the fact that, like the persons of the Holy Trinity, human beings are communal and other-oriented by nature. They're familial by nature. Now, the effectively unqualified rejection of same-sex unions and the reference to individual homosexual people could lead one to conclude that single life is the only option open to gay Catholics. But basing himself on the church's tradition, I would argue, Hansers von Balthasar denies that singleness is a normative state or vocation. As he puts it, it is clear from both the Old and the New Testaments that the person who is unmarried but not otherwise obligated is to be regarded not as the rule, but as the exception. Instead, both scripture and many luminaries in the church's history, many spiritual luminaries, indicate there are basically two normative states of Christian life, marriage and religious life, or consecrated virginity. Balthazar says that until one chooses a state of life, one must continue in a state of waiting. Now, this waiting period is valid while it lasts, but he says the virginity involved is quote, not to be confused with a definitive and absolute state, end quote. Just, if a definitive choice for either marriage or religious life never occurs, he says the life form of singleness continues to be one of prolonged waiting. Now, there can be borderline cases where, for example, a single person takes a vow of virginity within the context of her life in the world because entrance into a community is impossible for serious reasons. There are borderline cases. But he says we should never take those kind of exceptions to the rule as being a normative or valid third state in and of themselves. Controver somewhat controversial, debatable, we can get into that. But supposing he's right about that, and I think 
it's not at all implausible when you read church history. That, I, I don't think that's a, that's a, it's not a stretch to get that impression, let's say, that those are basically the two normative states of life. Right. What does that mean for gay Christians? Again, or, or Catholics with same-sex attraction, however we want to refer to them. I'm using that shorthand for the sake of time. Normatively speaking, and again, that's not counting the exceptional cases of lifelong singleness, it seems to entail that such Christians are either called to marriage, which would mean that they have to marry uh, someone from the opposite sex and have a, enter into a sexual relationship with them. And that does happen, especially among Mormonism. It's called a, they call them mixed orientation marriages. Uh, or that they have to enter religious life, which is kind of problematic, too, for reasons Pope Benedict talked about. But, uh, and of course, that, but, but let's go into that then. That consecrated religious life involves making commitments in the form of professing vows of poverty, vows of chastity and obedience. They require living continently and devoting yourself to prayerful service to others. Now, it normally means living in a community that is analogous to a family. It has brothers and sisters. It's led by an abbot, which comes from an abba, father, or a mother superior. Right? Now, God cured Adam's loneliness by putting him into a family, and the consecrated life is also usually a form of family life. So is there a monastic option for homosexual partnerships? Could chaste same-sex companionships become a kind of consecrated mini-community? Well, it's interesting because the historian Claudia Rapp argues that the Adolfo Poesis actually does have its origins in mon monasticism. That's where it comes from, originally. Um, now, Father Philip argues that even a... This is the key, okay? This is this was the part of his... It's really the gist of his article, and I really spent a lot of time thinking about it because... I think I do need to make this more clear than I did, and I appreciate him forcing me to. Father Philip argues that even a continent companionship between two mutually attracted persons of the same sex can never be chaste. They can be continent, maybe they're not having sex, but that doesn't mean it's chaste. And he argues that that's because two persons of the same sex can't give themselves to each other emotionally because they lack the necessary complementarity for that. And they're seeking the kind of emotional self-gift of marriage apart from the sacrament of marriage. And in a way, that's just like having sex outside of marriage. Right? You're taking a good of marriage and trying to have it without marriage. In this case, it's the emotional benefit, not the sexual one, but it, it's just as unchaste. Uh, and I really appreciate that because it gives me a chance to be a little more specific about what I mean here. Because I would argue the Adelpha Poesis is not meant to be two partners giving themselves to each other. Father Philip is obviously correct about this. Rather than viewing, and again, this is, this is the point Pope Francis makes, right? Adelpha poesis is in no way analogous to marriage. Thank you, darling. <laughs> but it, maybe it's analogous to the monastery, right? Because it's essentially monastic in nature, so it would be a form of them consecrating themselves to God by way of a lifestyle that involved mutual commitment to each other. Again, it's, it's more like the, the final vows of a monastery, more so than the vows of holy matrimony, which also involve a commitment to persons who are not God, right? You're making a commitment to your ordinary, whoever that is, to obey them right? and to live a certain way, right? And Thompson and Trower, again, these poets from the 50s, they have a spiritual father who guided them constantly. He would kind of serve the role of an abbot, right? And I don't, and I can't, I can't imagine this working at all unless you had a really strong spiritual director guiding you, right? But in that case where you'd have these vows, this commitment to live together in chastity, serving God together, praying together, having a spiritual director to guide you, and then working together, sharing your resources to serve God in the world. Sounds pretty close to, well, it sounds pretty close to a secular institute, by the way. Um, which, the secular institutes have men and women in them, right? Like the Madonna House here. And, you know, there's a, the possibility of sexual attraction there too, but the church has still seen fit to allow this. Right. Um, and let me conclude with this. Uh, I would add that the Adelpha Poesis doesn't need to be... Okay, I'll conclude. There's like two points, whatever. It does not need to be limited to gay couples, quote-unquote. So first of all, um, it, and this is my point, it doesn't have to be men who are like gay or, or consider their attraction to each other a sexual one. Uh, for example, King Malcolm, like I mentioned before, he is married to a saint, but he entered into one of these arrangements. Nor, by the way, does it need to be limited to two partners of the same sex. Uh, Leopold Kretzenbacher wrote, wrote in, a, in 1966, he witnessed uh, a ceremony between a man and a woman in a Serbian Orthodox church. Uh, 
So here, we, as I mentioned, we have arrangements like the civically divorced and remarried. You know, can't get a declaration of nullity. Well, perhaps there's an option there for them, where the church gives them an additional support in this difficult situation they have to live in, where they, they need to be continent but still live together, right? Or even, I mean, there's cases, right, of like men and women who just, they're both single, but they don't, they're really good friends who, but just don't feel called to marry each other. I mean, that does happen sometimes. Maybe that's something like this is what God's actually calling them to, perhaps. Now, building off of what's been discussed today, with, especially with Dr. Fast, right? The 20th century Russian Orthodox priest, scientist, and martyr Pavel Florensky argued that Christian love was a combination of selfless agape and friendly philia. Right? Um, and he says liturgically sanctioned friendship, you know, for, for him at least, is an essential aspect of the church and Christian society. And he explicitly deduces this from the Adelpha Poesis ritual. Uh, as Richard Gustafsson says, by talking about, by, by theologizing in the 20th century about Adelpha Poesis, Florensky moves the discussion of Christian life away from the union of the flesh to the union of the spirit, right? Now friendship is what's inherently Christian. To my knowledge, he says, Florensky is the first Christian theologian to place same-sex relationship at his center and vision of his thought. And he himself had a very close male friend, Sergei Troitsky. Now, I appreciate he is an orthodox theologian, but for what it's worth... Again, today's saint, John Paul II, mentions Florensky in Fides et Ratio as an example of a great Christian theologian who distinguished himself as a great philosopher, too. So he's, he's worth taking into account. Right. And this gives us an insight into where civic recognition of same-sex partnerships other than marriage might be valuable, right. which Pope Francis has endorsed, right, these civil unions. And it, that might not be him compromising with gay marriage, it might be him recognizing that if we're going to have a strong civil society where friendship flourishes, we might need some kind of civic recognition of that. And civil unions, again, don't even have to be between people who are sexually attracted to one another. Right? Uh, it could be that, you know, it was a way of giving government support to Christian friendship and genuine civil society, even if the secular world exploits this as an opportunity for sexual sin. Right? That this is a way back into something like the Adelpha Poesis. So... Uh, the, my thought concluding, the answer to the dubium was an opportunity to provide clarity, uh, but while the responsum correctly upheld the biblical and traditional teaching on sexual morality, it lacked a clear, a clear Christian alternative to Christians with homosexual inclinations, apart from a general encouragement to live by church teaching. I believe there's a more anthropologically sound option, which has been offered by the church historically, which is a committed and nurturing chaste unions between persons of the same sex as a form of self-denying consecration to God. And I think restoring this would not only be pastoral and nourishing to Catholics with this inclination, but it would also be a powerful witness to our oversexed world about the healing power of graced community, friendship, and chastity. Thank you. All right, so I don't really have time for questions, do I? Okay. Sadly. Uh, I was just interested uh, if you considered at all um, the some of the church's own more mystical tradition as a, a way to um, integrate in the discussion of um, Continent, if not chaste, mm. um, same sex unions, you would say, that might be pretty blessed mm. in the church. I'm thinking of, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the height of it for me would be like John of the Cross mm. or something like that, uh, where you get this. I mean, obviously, uh, I would say non sexual vision. Sure, sure, yeah. To, mm. uh, Romantic and uh, erotic, to use the sense of eros. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's this relationship. Just read his poetry with uh, directing the world toward God. Oh, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, gosh, okay, I'm trying to be attentive to time. So, of course, there's a whole mystical marriage tradition, right? Which is in the Carmelites um, and Catherine of Siena. There's that famous statue of her where she's in a kind of ecstasy. 
Um, and that's, again, that's not that like spirituality is sublimated sexuality. That's sexuality is an image of our ultimate ecstasy and union to God. And it is interesting that there is a um, blessed Bernardo de Hoyas, who um, I believe he was raised a servant of God under Benedict and Francis has made him, has beatified him. He, and he died when he was in his twenties, quite young, but he described having a mystical marriage to Christ. And you can connect this, I mean, there's a whole tradition, and I, I mention it briefly in my paper, about um, right, what Bernard of Clairvaux does with the um, uh, Song of Solomon, right? The idea that our, our souls are kind of feminine by nature, which is interesting because he's also a theologian of masculinity because he writes the Code of Chivalry, right, for the Knights Templar. But the idea that, like, there's something feminine about every human soul towards God and that we are the, that's what it means to be the bride of Christ in some sense, um, is there a possibility there that understanding that a romantic affinity between two men, right, between, uh, for example, Bernardo and Christ, shows that there can be, that, again, this chaste, intense, romantic friendship between two males can be a sacramental image of love between God and us? Uh, potentially, I think. Um, that would have to be parsed very carefully and responsibly. Um, but, but I mean, like Eve Tushnet, uh, she's, of course, a famous uh, gay Catholic who advocates for celibacy. She's clear. She says, look, by virtue of being a lesbian, that affects her relationship to the Blessed Mother. Right. And I would suggest that my being a straight male also affects my relationship to the Blessed Mother, just like it affects my relationship to, to Christ. Um, and there doesn't have to be the contaminations of like the weird sex stuff with that necessarily. So I think there's something there. I feel ill-equipped to talk about it, but I think it's valid. Yeah. Uh, Father Heisel. Oh, yeah. I read the Brother Bacon ceremony in the past, and what, what comes to mind is forms of friendship in the Mediterranean world are very different than they are mm -hmm. in Europe and North America. I mean, you remember some older pictures of, of Roman prelates walking arm in arm, which is a very typical way of expressing friendship in Italy. Or, or even in the Philippines, best friends will hold their shoulders when they're walking. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Lebanese men dance together at weddings. So I'm wondering if there's some sort of a cultural anachronism that we are committing when we read the brother making. Well, that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make, for sure, is that, um, I mean, even, you know, John lying in Christ's, uh, or the beloved disciple, whoever he is, right, reclining in the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. There, I mean, there's translations of the Bible that say he was near him, because to our Western ears or whatever, or North American wasp ears, that sounds too intimate and gay, right? Um, but I, this is kind of my point, though. Like, is it a, it's totally anachronistic when people look at those kinds of intimacy and say, well, those guys must have clearly secretly been gay. But my point is, like, where exactly, like, we have no access to the fact of whether, okay, let me put it this way. I also don't see any evidence from that to say, if you have a really intense friendship, you can enter this, but if it's romantic, you can't. All right. I, I, I don't see any of that in any of the liturgies or texts that I've read. Partly because I don't know if they would have even acknowledged that as a meaningful question, right? Um, are you tempted, to, you know, maybe some of them were tempted by lust for the person of the opposite sex. We don't know. The point is that they committed to never, to being chaste and being spiritual. So I don't, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's come out of a meaningless, yeah, it's a historical impossibility. That's why it's stupid to say it's, a same, it's any kind of same-sex marriage. Like I said, I don't think it has to be limited to same-sex partnerships at all. In fact, it clearly wasn't in every case. But what it might be is, it's, it's an answer to the world generally. To say, like, okay, we want civil society. Here's a ceremony of intense friendship that we can bless that's not sexual. But is almost as emotionally intense, maybe, as marriage. All right. And I think that's, that in and of itself is a rebuke to the world. Whether that's between, you know, divorce, civically divorced and remarried people or gay men or gay women or whoever, right? I think there's, there's just, in general, it's very fertile. There's a lot of possibility there, I think. Uh, sorry, Dr. Fast, go ahead. Sure. When you started, I thought it was going to go to Richard this direction, and I'm super interested. I'm glad I'm not ridiculous. So, something that struck me about Greek philosophy, the way that they think about friendship, a couple of observations. 
Aristotle and Plutarch, um, when, when they talk about friendship, one of the things that they observe that friendships are virtue, as opposed to the other friendships, is that they say, they say this repeatedly, they desire to live together. If they aren't living together, there's something about the friendship of virtue that's not able to be completely worked out. Mm -hmm. You have to have intimate knowledge of the other in order to work to together towards virtue. Okay, first observation. Second observation, one of the things that seems really key in the Socratic dialogues with Plato is he's observing institutions between members of the same sex that are sexualized. And he's trying to find a way to turn that towards something that's non-sexualized without destroying mm -hmm. intimacy. Right? I mean, this is a really common theme in those dialogues that I think bears some reflecting on. What, what's going on there? Right? Because he's, he's seeing that there's a relationship that's got pursuing something and has become sexual. Mm -hmm. But he wants to desexualize and then restore the relationship. Um, third thing that's in my mind, C.S. Lewis's observation in the essay Transposition about how we, um, the, our, our emotional life is much blunter than our intellectual life. And so we use the same emotional experience for multiple purposes. And cluttering in the diaphragm can mean very different things. Mm -hmm. right? And so part of what gives um, meaning to those emotional experiences is our understanding, our interpretation. But there's a certain amount of the way, the way in which we allocate a certain kind of meaning to it. Mm -hmm. And part of what our culture has done is taken these emotions that might have legitimate purposes and it's sexualized all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so there may be something to what you're saying about this sort of emotional bond that people can have out of the same sex, where it's not intrinsically of a sexual nature. But my question then would be if, people's are, are, if people are wounded such that they mm -hmm. have now habitually associated this something sexual, mm -hmm. might that not by its very nature mean that those are the people, the people who might otherwise mm -hmm. be most in need of this sort of relationship, have tragically become the people who are least able to enter into it because of their prior mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so someone, someone very dear to me made that comment, in fact, that, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, someone who may or may not be in the room said, without well, her concern, is that like, yes, you know, Maybe that's the case, but you know, isn't isn't that so? It's really risky, basically, to put two people who are attracted to each other together all the time. And, and I'd be inclined to say, based on your argument, maybe we should be looking at the, the doing this. I don't know. I'm not, that's well, the, that's my feeling. Like, okay, so the yeah, exactly, exactly the people who should not be going into those relationships. Right, right, right. Well, briefly, what I would say is, if that if that's the case, we need to find something else. And I'm not sure that saying be single but have lots of friends. Fits the bill. I'm not. I'm not sure that actually works for reasons I've mentioned. You know, it's not good for the man to be alone and stuff like this. That's actually not what I meant. By no, no, I understand. No, no, that's, I'm not saying that's what you're. But what I'm saying is, if it, if that were the case, fair enough. Then what? And I want the magisterium to answer that. But let me say. I mean, I think that that would be the case with um, right, like the secular institutes too, right? There's probably a lot of people there who. Have, well, I know we know that there are right people who've kind of had difficulties in life, and that's how God has drawn them into the secular institute. And now they are every day living and sleeping a few feet away from someone of the opposite sex who's gone through similar experiences to them, and they get along with because they have shared commitments. Right? Uh, there, there has to be some. Way, it, I understand. I definitely understand the idea of like there needs to be some kind of healing, and that might involve negation and purgation. But, but, but there has to be like a positive healing as well, and this seems like an option for that. And, and I think we need to at least have this conversation, which is why I'd like the magisterium to, to weigh in on it. Sorry, Father Heisel, I can't, I can't overrule. Yes. Mm -hmm. so what, what I find frustrating about this whole conversation is the church already has a tremendous, and if you know much tradition, you have to hear in the passion. Mm -hmm. And you see that, especially in the Byzantine tradition, but also, there's also a very strong element of the hearing of the passion than Hermetic anthropology. And, and this is more of a, of a comment or, mm -hmm. or a lament than a question. Mm -hmm. we, this is not a pastoral tool that is being taught to seminarians in Clem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's, I think there's great promise in that in, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in when you're hearing the people who experience the of the passion because fundamentally, St. Thomas says that we're all designed to enjoy the light. Mm -hmm. And one of the strategies that St. Thomas offers in, in combating faith delight is to find out the light in God. Mm -hmm. and, and in that, and, and in so doing, our passion begins to be healed. Mm -hmm. That whole tradition is being sidestepped by many of the church's pastors 
Mm-hmm. Right, right, yeah, yeah. No, and, and an area where that's helpful is when you're at seminary and you have a spiritual director who you see every couple of weeks, but most people don't have that kind of access. So what my thought or feeling would be, finally, would be how do we institutionalize some way that the people who are most in need of that kind of help have a spiritual director who's around them a lot? Well, maybe if we give them a kind of mini monastery with their own personal abbot and their own little rule, right, that tries to bring this kind of effective healing to them and this spiritual realignment of what they have with their own personal pastor almost. Right? That, that would be my question, I guess. Is that a possibility? Right. So, Anyways, thanks very much, everybody. Oh.